going to do an experiment in class teaching that um, just came to me this morning, maybe even an epiphany. It may have been Dante. Actually, I didn't have any real feeling of a deity or hero or heroine inspiring me to come up with this brilliant idea. But it is a brilliant idea. It is probably the most brilliant idea I have had in this decade, as a matter of fact. And I have had quite a few. Give me a golf clap of your love and affection. I am so damn smart. Am I not? Am I, not? Am I right, Rich? Yeah. It's pretty good. Yes, Tanisha. Actually, it's your fault, Nisha. Nisha. Let's give Nisha a golf clap of our love and affection. She came up and asked me this question after class. And I started thinking, I love the Catabatic Project. I love it because it's so creative and it's fun and it's an opportunity for you to do something, if you so choose, artistic and fun and artsy. Or if not, you know, write a paper or, you know, give people a choice. The problem is I get a hundred of these and I would rather read these, look at these. I have people who made a catabasis game, catabasis board game last year. And I promised I would play it with them. So, and they are reminding me that the, these two girls that made this game up said that, you know, you still haven't played with us. And really, I mean, it's fun to, you know, it's gratifying for me as a teacher to think, wow, these people have gotten something out of my class that is so interesting that they decided to do, ah. The flip side of it is I don't, I have like about this many exams to grade at the end of the semester. And it's always like a tug of war. And sometimes there are no winners except for the vodka. So, uh, but I have to have something. And it really is probably you that made me, got me thinking about this. The public affairs hell. Dante was a very public affairsy kind of dude, as I proved to you completely in the last lecture right? This guy, in his own way, for all the other things he did, basically invented his own homeland, or got the process going, by inventing the Italian language and then writing his divine comedy in it. That's how badass he was, but you probably <laughs> care less about that, and I don't blame you here, than you care about the idea of concentric circles of hell. Madeline. Um, and I talked to you last time, you know, asked you to be reading this fine poem, The Inferno of Dante, with a view towards creating your own little three-level hell of three crimes you consider personally bad. And that gives you a lot of scope to be creative. And Lord knows, I like being creative. I mean, um, this has got to be, this is never going to make you rich. The things you learn in this class, no matter what the public affairs mission states, is never going to make you rich. So it must be enjoyable. It must be helpful to you in some other respect. Love the idea of you deciding which three crimes you think are the worst and then punishing them. Me? I'd like to just punish groups of people for being evil. Me, I'd like to punish slow drivers. I mean, and figuring out the punishment for slow drivers would be really fun. It would be, you know, like hog tying somebody and throwing them back into, in, in, no, making them drive. There you go, a 1995 Oldsmobile Cutlass Sierra behind some old blue haired lady in a Buick forever and ever through all eternity, and she stops at every yellow light. I mean, that's kind of cute, kind of fun, kind of Springfield-y, I like that. Or administrators, whose only purpose in life is to have nice clothes and a nice office. I literally have lain awake at night thinking about appropriate punishments for that. Probably better not leave that one in there, Rich. <laughs> but then I thought, what better way to demonstrate the vitality of Dante as a heavy-duty public affairs type of dude, 
What better way to demonstrate the eternal, literally eternal validity of setting up levels of hell and then assigning them to people for their sins than having you do as a catabatic project your own public affairs hell. Ladies and gentlemen, a hand of applause for the inventor of public affairs hell. Oh, <laughs> so touching. Next, give yourselves a nice hand of applause too for prying this out of my head. Come on. Because this is going to be um, part of an I course, a course which is going to consist strictly of recorded lectures, such as the ones that Rich has been taping the last week. He has a whole bunch of me from 2012 as well. And as opposed to you folks who have the joy of coming in and seeing me every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 1045 or whenever the hell it is I show up, um, these kids, I don't even hand them a syllabus on the first day of class anymore. I show them a web page. The syllabus is here. Here's where you find the lectures. Here's the study guide. Good luck. And that's why it's so essential, kids, that you participate today, that you make wise ass remarks, that you know you make snotty suggestions and stuff like that. It's all well and good for me to come and give you an assignment and answer questions about it for the next four class periods. You know, I do that. That's part of my job. Keep in mind that the I-course format just means they come in. Sometimes they don't even come in and meet you anymore. You just watch the introduction lecture on, um, you can actually take an I-course at this university, I guess, without ever personally encountering the individual who taped it. Is that right, Rich? So there, I mean, these people are never going to ha have the benefit of me telling them stories about dumb crap I did when I was a kid, your age, or hearing exciting stories about my dog, or hearing me pick up the phone in class and talk to my dad, or something like that, or pestering me after class or before class for things about the class, or even making, you know, snide references that crack me up, but I can't admit that I'm laughing because I'm too busy trying to teach you all something. They're never going to have that. They're never going to have the joy of sitting in my classroom while I'm blathering away and doing this. Doesn't matter. Hey, you're looking at somebody who's got two on the hook at match.com. Let's give me a golf clap of your admiration. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should be asking for you for advice. I figured, I, w I honestly figured when I married the love of my beloved wife, Moopy, I figured that I was done dating for the rest of my life. It is my fondest wish for all of you. You find the one you want. You enter into a happy relationship with that person and are happy, never have to date again. You know, Rich, I hope that someday, 55 years from now, you're sitting on the porch playing with your great grand, watching your great grandchildren. The big, huge foot comes out and stomps you and Amy very painlessly and sweetly to the ground. They say, Well, that's how great grandpa and great grandma went out. <laughs> it is what a way to go. And, and I mean, life handed me a shit sandwich. Um, so things are looking up. Maybe I should, <laughs> maybe I should check texts and like, click, clap. <clears throat> if you are watching this on iTunes, the chances are that you have never interacted with me personally to any extent, and perhaps never will, and the great majority of you will be very happy for that fact. Isn't that right, class? Uh, let's try that again. <clears throat> if you're watching this on iTunes, the chances are that you have never really had any substantial chance to interact with me, the deluxe years truly, in any substantial personal manner. 
Many of you should be very glad for that. Isn't that right, class? No. I think so. no. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, they're, they're, they're missing out. OK. Sucks to be you. <laughs> You're watching this on tape. And everybody else in this room is watching me live. Sucks to be you, right, class? I don't care. I told you to be yourselves and I meant it. <laughs> Perhaps the single most famous feature of Dante's Inferno, which is cited by people that I've met, numerous people I've met that have never read Dante's Inferno, is the conception of sinners being, and look, I got a red magic marker today to concentric levels of hell, the lower, the worse. Okay, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Lucifer. And then below Lucifer. Dr. Phil. And I'm owning that. All right. The idea is that there is a hierarchy of sins going back from, you know, like gluttony and lust all the way down to making shifty deals with money, betraying your country and all of that. And the original intent of the little exercise I suggested in our last class was for you to select three major crimes or sins or what have you that particularly offended you. And I was expecting good results from that. And I know I would get good results for that. But as somebody who has, um, as a faculty member at Missouri State University, who has fleeting bouts of seriousness, I realize that we must, in this class, LT 180, The Heroic Quest, is a course that people take only for general education requirements. I know that, I'm fine with that. Point being is that we have to make sure, I have to make sure that people in my class have some familiarity with the three parts of the public affairs mission and I have to have some proof that you are actually applying the knowledge of the public affairs mission you've gotten in this course. Somebody trying to bust in here? Come on in, come on in. Plenty of seats, no waiting. Okay, let's start out. What are the um, three, shall we say, pillars of the public affairs mission? Anybody? Blurt. Cultural competence. That's a good one to start out with because cultural competence is actually the area of public affairs that this course is supposed to address. Another one, please. Very dynamic. Ethical leadership. And that's our secondary focus in this class according to the general education rules. And then the other, other ever popular. Oh, so sweet. Please notice that I am not going to ask you to define these topics on camera right now. That would be kind of embarrassing, especially given my own firm conviction that if you cornered the average faculty member on this university and asked that person, define ethical leadership. They might make a few cracks about administrators, but they don't think about things like that. Faculty doesn't really think about things like that. You don't either. Cultural competence, I mean, it's one of those things that sounds really good, but if you ask your average faculty member or staff member or student at the university to define it just like that, you couldn't. 
I'm not going to put you through any humiliation that I wouldn't put myself through. I will tell you that the definitions that I shared with you last time, the old definitions, which um, are apparently out of favor, include cultural competence as being able to recognize yourself, understand your own culture. It includes being able to understand the culture of others, being able to communicate with others of different cultures, being able to function perhaps in a globalized world where no, Springfield, Missouri, this classroom in Springfield, Missouri, corner of Grand and National is not the center of the universe. There's a great big world around us and it's gotten a lot smaller since I was in college deciding whether to come to school on Friday morning or not. Ethical leadership means identifying the principles and uh, morals that you yourself choose to practice and constantly reevaluating these principles and acting on these principles when called upon to stand up for what you believe in or to demonstrate something useful, like Antigone did, like poor Creon did. Community engagement means finding needs in the community and working with others, sharing your own gifts, not necessarily leading, to solve these problems. Armed with these working definitions, what I plan to do is have students for their catabatic project, your catabatic project, is to create a public affairs hell. A public affairs hell in which you can rank these three in any order you want. Okay, in regard to the, your importance, I would put ethical leadership as the most important, cultural competence followed by community engagement because I mean, that's to me, everybody should do that anyway. Basically the premise of Dante's Inferno is he assigns a specific place in hell to everybody or anybody who ever made him really mad. This is your opportunity to assign a place in hell to um, people, individuals, groups, categories of people, I don't care, that make you angry. But you have to do it on the basis of public affairs. In a typical public affairs catabasis, I'm going to make up Maurice's public affairs catabasis. I'm going to say that the lowest level is reserved for ethical leadership violators. Then probably cultural comp violators. Followed by the one that I don't really care the much about is community engagement. And as an extra prize, as a little cherry on the top, your favorite goes here. I mean, for whatever reason, you have to listen to charge. You have to listen to charge like, You want to put me in there suffering the burning eternal fires of hell? I'll let you do it. <laughs> you just got to tell me why. Like for having an annoying voice and making references to musical groups nobody ever heard of, I will hereby send the deluxe yours truly to eternal smoke and hell. See, that's why I wanted you sitting up there close to me so I could glower at you more effectively. <laughs>
seriously. Is it fairly clear what I'm asking for here? And hopefully, if you're, go hit me with your best shot, Nisha. We're explaining why we're putting each of those and giving you examples of the people for each. Precisely. And um, if you like, I mean, I'll let you pick first. If you like, you don't have to. Let's do some examples here. Who would you send to public affairs hell? I'm not asking you, Rich. Don't you ask me. Girls who wear tights as pants. Thank you, Andrea. Let's give her a golf clap of our love and affection. And which category of public affairs does girls who wear tights as pants? Guys, do you agree with that? <laughs> well, okay. See, that's a cultural, comp that's a cultural competence thing right there. Um, where would you put them? They are, I'm just repeating this, in, you know, not out of mockery to make sure it gets on the tape because whenever we do these call and response things, I have to remind myself that I'm mic'd, you ain't. Or would you like to say it more loudly? I'm not sure if I put my voice in They are not aware of the world around them and they are not aware of themselves. Any punishment that you might think of? You can put that on hold, put that on hold. Okay, that's an example. You need a few more for each level. You know, I mean, you can't just give me one for each and call it a paper. What do you got, Kara? What do you got? Well, I said, if we're talking about tights or leggings, if we're talking about leggings, I'm going to that hell. Because <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Okay. Now, see, that's a matter of cultural competence, too. And it really is. I mean, this happens to me all the time when I start talking politics on Facebook because I am extremely liberal. I have friends that I consider dear friends who are extremely conservative. I can talk with conservative people. I think they're deluded. Conservative people talk with me. They think I'm deluded. I'm cool with that. I really am. And it really has nothing to do with anything in this class, but you got to be, I guess, kind of mindful. One time I was talking with Steve, and I happened to mention, Steve is very, very, very conservative, retired off colonel in the United States Army. I told him that Keith Olbermann was a great, big, huge, fat-headed, egotistical, pompous windbag, which I, hardly, which I believe. I just love him for the enemies he makes. I can't bear to watch him talk about anything. And Steve almost started crying. He was so touched to hear somebody who is liberal take a really big, huge dump on a very famous literal journalist, liberal journalist. He was so touched, in fact, that he confided to me that what he wanted out of life was 10 minutes alone in a dark room with Dick Cheney. <laughs> you know who got five draft exemptions or whatever from serving in the United States Army while idiots like Steve went ahead and went to Vietnam, which I thought was very touching. We had like a little breakthrough moment. That was like, I don't know, 2007. I'm scheduled for another one in 2022 or something. So more, more suggestions. More suggestions. Did you come up with a punishment or do you got one? Go ahead, John. Uh, Lindsay Lohan, Britney Spears, or any other celebrity who <coughs> fell out of favor due to drug use? <coughs> That's a very good one. Okay, and I'm sure anybody think of some more who could fit into this happy category. Catherine, you got one? People who talk too loud in the theater. Ooh, that's definitely, what does, it, what does that come under? Reagan. Celebrities that can uh, get out of charges just because they're famous, like somebody getting a DUI or getting caught with steroids or certain types of drugs, and they can get out almost scot-free and the regular civilians get a lot of jail time. To me, that's a lot of BS. No, absolutely, Reagan. Let's give, hang on, we, save yours, please. We gotta give Reagan a golf clap of our love and appreciation. Because to me, I'm not saying that all celebrities have to be leaders or role models. I mean, do I really want to live my life thinking what would Prince do? I mean, Prince would put on a thong and dye his hair purple and trim his mustache and go, ah, 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 you know, I mean, that's not how I intend to live my life. 
<laughs> um, but I think, and this is a view I've expressed in this classroom before, people, to, people who have been given a lot of money, people who have been given great gifts, they really do owe the world a little bit more, I believe, than Bubakus and Jethro do. You and I have all gotten to go to college. A lot of people don't. We should use it and basically go to class on Friday mornings. I'm talking myself into a hole here, am I not? There's another aspect of it. It's called rich people get off. It's called affluenza, if you've ever heard of that, where people who have lots and lots of money will sometimes get convicted of horrible things and walk for precisely the reasons you, <laughs> like Ray Lewis, like the DuPont heir who apparently had sex with his three-year-old daughter and they did not give him jail time because they thought he would not fare well in jail. Yeah, I know. I mean, I would hope that he did not have a nice time in jail, okay? Um, whereas you know as well as I that if any of us went over into um, that, that, that uh, convenience store, the... It's, yeah, across the street, and tried to hijack a six-pack of beer. We would get our very own ride to the police station with a real police officer in our hands behind the back. We could have a couple of free nights lodging at the Greene County Jail and a court date and probably prison after that. Darn, that makes me mad. Where do you want to put that, Reagan? Um, you would put that ethical le leadership violators, maybe? And that may be, too, about the Lindsay Lohan and stuff like that junk, too, because Lord knows I really do try in my own bizarre way to set a good role model for you kids. I laugh and make fun of everything and draw stupid pictures up on the blackboard. Once you start reading Bre Kurt Vonnegut's Breakfast of Champions, you'll know where I picked that habit up. I am trying to teach you to question authority, but I am also trying to teach you that, yeah, there is such a thing as authority, and we do got to kind of behave. And sometimes we do have to just like suck it up and take that damn public affairs mission seriously. Or <clears throat> sometimes we have to take the public affairs mission more seriously than we have been doing. All right, any more? Who else wants to volunteer? Michael. Uh, Closed-minded people in any... Closed any okay, I go with that. I definitely go with that. And I go with that on the, on the understanding that if you're going to pick that one out and um, I want you to pick out a closed-minded person from either side, at least two different sides of the political spectrum. One of the things I always try to point out when having a pleasant discussion with my conservative friends are, there are plenty of people on my quote unquote side who are closed minded, pompous, you know, people who know things because they know things. And that's just wrong no matter where you live on the political spectrum. I like that. I like that a whole lot. Who else? You gotta have some more. Go ahead, Larry. Um, you know that saying that if you're any good, uh, paying for a, a bunch of people to tell them about some truth they don't know what they're doing, or they just scam their own operation? Scamming charities, maybe? Because I do think I know what you're doing. You know, it's like, let's set up a, uh, I'm gonna set up a um, charity for the, the people with severely receding hairlines. And you're. <laughs> and you're all going to be giving a substantial donation by the time the semester is over, because that's basically how I grade. But the point is, if I spend it on really trying to reach out to bald people, bald guys who have no good role models, because bald guys are always the bad guy, um, and always look like dorks in cartoons, and it's true, we do, huh? Well, and see, that's when we're going to give every bald guy, or potentially bald guy, a copy of an X-Men comic so he can have a bald role model. And basically the rest of the money goes to buying me Heinekens and Hoo-Hot. 
Pardon? Does that mean Vin Diesel's his own role model since he's bald? I don't really consider him truly bald. I think he shaves. <laughs> and it's like this Fire. distinction that Kara was making, you know, is it leggings or pants? And Andrea says it's the whole, you know, I'm kidding, of course. I'll give you my pet peeve, okay, and I'm making this personal. You know that I lost my beloved wife to breast cancer on January 14th, 2011. Whenever I see a pink garbage cart or a, you know, $2 thing of yogurt with a r pink ribbon on it, it drives me berserk. It drove my beloved wife after she was diagnosed in 2008, underwent a uh, radical mastectomy, went through six rounds of TAC chemo and radiation after that. And I still hang around with her buddies from the, our mutual buddies from the breast cancer support groups. It just drives them out of their mind. I really do think that there is a um, cultural competence, place in cultural competence hell for anybody who would try to make a little extra money for their bleeping disposal service by offering you a pink garbage cart for two extra bucks a month then claiming they do it all in the name of raising awareness of breast cancer. I mean, anybody in this room could get breast cancer. Men get breast cancer. Your chances are much greater if you're a woman, obviously. How many of you in this room do not know of somebody close at hand? I'm not asking for a show of hands. We are all really, really, really aware of breast cancer. And as my wife and her breast cancer friends recognize too, that yeah, breast cancer is their least favorite cancer because that's the one they have. I have a very dear friend, my friend and veterinarian, Ted Hamaker, great guy in this town who, um, they didn't even know after his autopsy what cancer he died of. Wow, that was righteous, I'm sorry. Somebody tell a stupid joke or draw something on the board because I just planted a whole category of people. So thanks for kicking me. Let's give Larry a golf clap of our love and appreciation. Any more? Yes, go ahead. No, your name in the back is? Joel, you haven't said much to us, Joel, and I know, Reagan, you've already contributed. Hit it with our best shot. Um, any of the press IOFs that are responsible for keeping us in two wars for over 10 years? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are a lot of, again, shades of belief in, you know, foreign policy. But are you a veteran by any chance? So, okay. Um... I will just say here that I once had a student who was very, 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 very conservative. And no doubt he still is very, 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 very conservative. He was in the 101st Airborne. Okay. Well, then you probably could finish this joke better than I could. The person, one person he wants to kill more than anybody, he was one of the first people to be wounded in Iraq. And I just let it slip the words, Geraldo Rivera. What did he do? Oh, he was on camera, and he basically said, I'm here with the 101st Airborne in blah, blah, blah. And we're talking to the guys here, and they nice work, you pompous ass clown. You have just given everybody in the whole, you know, Iraqi army our coordinates. Excuse us while we run to our Humvees, but let us first tie you out to a rock. But the thing that Chris said to me, he said, you know, I'm not any less conservative than before, but I would love to ask the president, Mr. President, what on earth are American forces doing in this country? And I thought that was pretty fair that, you know, Chris stepped out of his comfort zone because, God, we argued politics sometimes. And it was fun. 
but he didn't let himself be bound by ideology. He said, you know, I thought this was wrong. Now, the Afghanistan war, my personal belief is that we needed to do. That was the right war, a war we could have perhaps come a lot closer to winning had we not been doing the other war of choice thing. But thank you. Let's give Joel a golf clap of our love and appreciation. Okay, got another one. Reagan, did you have another one? Anybody, anybody, please get into the good book. Yes. People who get mad in traffic going to a event like a circus or a football game when that traffic is also going to the circus or football game. I think I follow that. I was afraid it was, it was starting to look bad at first, John, when you were talking about people who get angry in traffic. You're talking at some, to Tom, you, you know, who once threw a lit stogie, tried to throw a lit stogie through the window of his car into somebody else's car, only to have it blow back and burn a new big, huge hole. In his, I'll buy that. People who just don't know, who won't educate, it's a cultural competence thing here. For many years, there was a, well, there is a church called the James River Assembly of God. Regardless what you think of evangelical megachurches, these people would put on the mother of all firework shows way out there, you know, out in the middle of nowhere to the east of town. My wife and I would go to them all the time. We had a great time. If you wanted to get, you know, to speak a bit more about religion, they had people there to talk about it. But people would write letters to the news leader saying, I just don't get it. The first James River Assembly of God puts on this big fireworks show, and then, you know, how dare they think that they can proselytize us? I'm thinking, hello, you are going to a fireworks show sponsored by a church. So if it gets a little churchy from time to time and that bothers you, Go buy some bottle rockets or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. You got to, you know, wait in line. I understand. Patience. No yelling. I got you. Much. I need to see who else wants to jump in. I know you guys have been really awesome. I would love to take, you know, you got one, Courtney? I'm looking okay, pause. <laughs> Let's give Courtney a golf clap of our sorrow. Those, I have never worked in retail. I've known people who do. It's just like, I, okay. Well, there are a few lots I work in, specifically Christian retail, but it really bugs me. People who, in a small retail store, like to secretly take clothing items back and try them on and leave them with the owner at Stains. I propose we lump those into a um, community engagement because that's just uncivilized behavior and you know I think that Christians you know um, and people who aren't even religious you know atheists shouldn't do that either but I would also suggest that we open that up a little bit to people who treat waiters and waitresses badly I used to think it was really cute I was having lunch, dinner with my cousin Annie up in Minneapolis Annie is my age she's just really a wonderful human being and I was paying for dinner, and I laid down this huge tip for the waiter because, you know, he's a good waiter. He, he left us alone to talk. I like that. He let us keep our plates. He didn't say, take your plate, sir. No. And Annie complimented me. I said, Annie, that is a lesson you taught me when we were teenagers. I said, I used to think it was cute to be mean to waitresses. And one time I saw you lay down this huge tip for a waitress, and I said, why are you doing that? And she, and she told me, she said, I was a, I'm a waitress now. I get it. And I have remembered that the rest of my life. So there, how about for people who are mean to retail clerks and um, anybody in the service industry? And what would be a good punishment for them? And what? And only rude people go to that register. And only rude people and go to that register. Only themselves go. They have to face themselves. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, you're from public confidence. You'll have to be engagement out there. That would be really wonderful. You could clone them. And say, I can see it now. Who is this fat, bald guy? 
who smiles and hands me 50 cents every time I spend two hours waiting on his table. <laughs> That's just cruel. Okay, we got time for one more before I pack this up. And I want to thank you. This has been fun. Go ahead, Nisha, and then Madeline. For people that um, are ashamed of special needs people and don't want to wait on them or extremely rude to them when they can't help at all. Thank you, Nisha. I think that that is really great because I have been up until recently, you know, dating a woman whose um, kid has a 10-year-old autistic kid. And I mean, it's heartbreaking. And if you get to know these kids, like, you know, Steven, Steven is a hoot. He knows, it's like talking to a little professor. And he went, we had a competition to see who could draw the ancient Egyptian god Ra better. <laughs> he smoked me. <laughs> he smoked me. And I, I mean, I saw the humor in it. I mean, he actually, I mean, yes. Absolutely. People who judge on the basis of, and I would also throw in uh, mental illness in that one. I'm mentally ill. I've been diagnosed with clinical depression. I've been taking meds for going on 20 years. You ever want to talk about it, come down and talk about it with me. I don't care. It's like, I'm bald. <laughs> okay, Madeline, one more and then we'll call it a day. <laughs> Toll booths. Let's work on this. Let's work on this. Let's um, practice community engagement. I know. Toll booths, like at the airport when it's like 10 o'clock and you just want to get home and you got to pay somebody X amount of money to get out. Or the Internal Revenue Service. I owe them $3,001. You don't, kid, son, you don't know about the IRS. It's kind of like the, the judge. It's kind of like the dude with the glasses and, oh, brother, where art thou? <clears throat> Rounding down is a human conception, okay? Um, yeah, anybody who charges you to do money, mo lots of money to do stuff that should be free. And they should be forced to talk to somebody on the IRS over and over. Oh, also anybody who works in a call center, along with um, clerks and servers. Kids, I want to thank you for prompting some good ideas out of my head and sharing yours. Give yourselves a golf clap of your love and appreciation because you guys rock. Have a great weekend.